Greetings. What a glorious historical day of our first woman of color ever in this colonized country being nominated to any major political party, Kamala Harris, to start the evening with an APTA DEI discussion on race and racism. I'm excited to have you all with us at APTA to continue the conversations happening on race and racism which will be the topic of today's discussion, including the perspectives of those of us in the physical therapy profession. My name is Hadia Green Guerrero. I am one of the physical therapists in the practice department, and it is my honor and pleasure to be joined by physical therapy leaders, Drs. Eddie Trailer, Erin Embry, and Kai Kennedy. I'm gonna share my screen with you all. And we're just gonna look at some of the things that APTA is doing in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Are you all seeing the screen now? Nope. Okay. We'll try that again. All right. Sorry for that delay. So I wanna kind of start to frame the conversation and talk a little bit about diversity, equity, and inclusion. During this discussion, we'll go over some operational definitions after the speaker introductions. Um, I wanna start by offering APTA's definitions for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity, in this case, when we are looking at using the Ford Foundation definitions from 2008, 18, which our House of Delegates has expanded upon in our position on diversity, equity, and inclusion at the American Physical Therapy Association is the regression of all, the representation of all varied identities and differences collectively and as individuals. Equity seeks to ensure fair treatment, equality of opportunity, and parity in access to information and resources for all. Inclusion builds a culture of belonging by actively inviting the contribution and participation of all people. The diagram on the screen now is the John Hopkins Wheel of Dimensions of Diversity. And you can see that there's a core and you can see that there's an outer perimeter and all of these things that are listed, anything from age, religion, education, political beliefs, religion, income, national origin, sexual orientation, mental, physical ability, and more are the things that join and intersect to contribute to the diverse dimensions of diversity, equity, and inclusion. APTA is not unlike any other organization and it is made up of different dimensions as well. Just as there are many dimensions of diversity, equity, and inclusion, APTA comprises itself of, as a member organization. We have the profession, the society, and the interplay of APTA as an employer. APTA's mission is transforming society by optimizing movement to improve the human experience. Our vision is transforming society by optimizing movement to improve the human experience. The strategic plan for APTA includes stewardship which is fostering long-term sustainability of the physical therapy profession, which includes to make APTA an inclusive organization that reflects the diversity of the society, 
the profession serves. The House of Delegates has charges and adoptions of other positions that are under the umbrella of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and includes some of the most recent ones that have been charged or recharged listed here on your screen. One being RC 11, 17 for increasing professional diversity, RC 21, 19 to adopt APTA's commitment to diversity and RC 24, 19, which charges APTA as a community and profession to increase the professional diversity, equity, and inclusion in clinical, educational, and research settings. The language of the commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion is the position that affirms the American Physical Therapy Association supports efforts to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion to better serve the association, the profession, and society. Further, RC 2419 charges the American Physical Therapy Association in collaboration with stakeholders identify and implement best practice strategies to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion within the profession of physical therapy to include clinical, educational, and research settings to better meet the needs of society. Some of the things that APTA is doing under the breath, the breath of diversity, equity, and inclusion include member organized diversity, equity, and inclusion committees which are now at a 16 and rising count of being created or in the process of being created across the components, which includes both sections and cha state chapters. APTA has a PT Moves Me campaign that involves PT and PTA programs and member volunteers, as well as funding efforts, which include the Minority Scholarship Fund and Dimensions of Diversity. APTA has also put forth and supportive legislative efforts that include APTA student recruitment efforts, which include pipeline work, intentional outreach to underrepresented and underserved communities, and fostering partnerships with organizations such as Future Health Professionals, formerly Health Occupation Students of America, and the National Society for High School Scholars. I'd like to take this opportunity without further ado to introduce you to our speakers. Let's start with Dr. Aaron Embry. Dr. Embry is completing a PhD in Health and Rehabilitation Sciences at the Medical University of South Carolina, focusing on gait mechanics and in individuals with lower extremity amputation. He has worked as a physical therapist in a variety of settings, but most recently as a research therapist for MUSC and a staff physical therapist at the Ralph H. Johnson VA Medical Center, focusing on telerehabilitation programs for survivors with neurological disease diagnosis. Embry has served in many capacities, most notably as the first president for APTA South Carolina, who is black or a person of color. Aaron, if you would start us off with a couple of minutes of your relationship to race, racism and the physical therapy profession, professionally and or personally. Thank you, Dia. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I think we'll have a good conversation today. I'm, I'm really glad to be joined by Kai and Eddie, um, two people who I actually admire and look up to in this rate in this in this space when we're talking about race, racism, social justice, um, equity, equality, um, all the above, and we'll get into that. Uh, but a little bit about me um, and where I come from and why this is so important to me. So um, I was born in the late '70s to a white mother and a black father, and I was born to a traditional Irish Catholic family. My father served in the military, so that just kind of sets basic background. Um, for who I am and where I come from. I had one of those interesting upbringings that until I was born, part of my family didn't like the other part and vice versa, right? 
Um, and so it made it really interesting as a child to understand you're going to have to have a lot of conversations about race, what it means to be a mixed race child. Um, and fun fact is even in the 80s, you had to pick. There wasn't all of the different choices that we have now on a chart. You literally, you had to choose black or white. And whether you want to believe in the one drop rule that was once a rule in our country, it was a thing and you kind of had to pick one. Um, I was very fortunate and blessed to be able to make that decision. And so my entire life, of course, sort of considered myself a black man, but I'm able to pass, which puts me in some really interesting spaces and situations. When you get in healthcare, when you get into physical therapy, um, you're, you're confronted with a lot of people who have a lot of biases and a lot of internal and external uh, or overt and covert uh, racism and races and beliefs. Um, and so it's put me in a space where I continue to stay engaged and interested in making a meaningful difference, not just for me, but for my kids, but our patients, but just society as a whole to really uncover what's going on um, and to make a difference. So that's just a little bit to start with. I'm sure we'll get into more. And I look forward to hearing more about my, my co-presenters, co-panelists today. Thank you. And our next speaker that I'll introduce is Dr. Kai Kennedy who serves as an associate professor and vice chair of equity in the Department of Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Science at the University of California, San Francisco, or UCSF. Kennedy has extensive experience addressing issues of health equity and works with partners to scale up care for marginalized communities in the United States and around the world. She has a keen interest in developing innovative curricular strategies that prepare students to approach their practice with a health equity lens. Dr. Kennedy has a longstanding record of professional service and currently serves on the APTA nominating committee. Dr. Kennedy. Good afternoon, good evening, um, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm Kai Kennedy and I am speaking to you today from Oakland, California. Uh, but my hometown is Richmond, Virginia. It's where I was born and raised. It's where I went to PT school. And it's where I worked for the first almost decade of my career. Um, I've always had an interest in health equity before I knew to use that term, right? Um, and what I, what I can recount from early on in childhood is an immense pressure that perhaps I placed on myself and perhaps was placed on me by society. Um, to really build bridges between my community and um, potential or possibility. Um, I recall in the second grade is when I was switched from mainstream education K-12 into the advanced track. And from that moment until now, I've been usually the one black face in the crowd. There have been a few moments in my career where I've had some counterparts, um, and I count Aaron and Hadia and Eddie amongst those people. Um, so I um, have had a really interesting journey toward this pursuit of what we're calling health equity now, um, but it's always been about giving opportunities um, to everybody to pursue their highest level of uh, humanity, their highest level of existence in this world. Um, so I'm excited today to talk about um, opportunities that we have to improve that in our profession. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for being here. And I'll read Eddie's. And Dr. Eddie Trailer serves as the Director of Clinical Education in the Doctor of Physical Therapy program at Langston University in Oklahoma. He earned his bachelor's degree in physical therapy from Langston University, master's degree from the University of Central Oklahoma, and doctor in physical therapy degree from Alabama State University. He also is a board certified orthopedic clinical specialist and fellow of the American Academy of Physical Therapy. Trailer has maintained membership at APTA since 1992 and belongs to the Academy of Clinical Electrophysiology and Wound Management, Academy of Geriatric Physical Therapy, Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy, and the Academy of Physical Therapy Education. He served as an item writer for the National Physical Therapy Exam and was involved in the Specialization Academy of Content Experts as an item writer for orthopedics. He was recently appointed to the Specialty Council for Wound Management Specialist Certification and serves as the item review coordinator. 
Dr. Trailer. Thank you so much, Hadaya. Uh, listening to all of these wonderful people, I'm wondering how I was even included in this uh, trio here, but I appreciate it. Thanks to APTA for sponsoring these events and doing what it takes to move forward. A little bit about myself. Uh, I, of course, grew up in Oklahoma. I have a little bit of exposure to what we would call racism, to somewhat being able to, first of all, go to school in a location that three years prior didn't allow any people of color to be in the school or in the town. I also am privileged and proud to say that I have raised two young men, two boys, and their mother happens to not be a person of color. And so to see some of the things that they have actually had to go through and some of the things that I have gone through, and then when we get to the professional realm and you make that decision that you're a physical therapist and you think that everything is just peachy and then there's some little problems that creep up along the way and you go, okay, I'm a professional, I can get through this. So I am excited for the opportunity. And I think that we should get some good information, hopefully out of this. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, be able to move forward. Thank you, Dr. Chairman. We want to start with laying out some operational definitions in addition to the ones given at the top of the hour on DEI and then give the panel an opportunity to respond. The first definition for operation sake in conversation will be race. For many people, it comes as a surprise that race, racial categorization schemes were invented by scientists to support worldviews that viewed some groups of people as superior and some as inferior. There are three important concepts linked to this fact. Race is a made up social construct and not act an actual biological fact. Race designations have changed over time. Some groups that are considered white in the United States today were considered non-white in previous eras in US census data and in mass media and popular culture. For example, the Irish, Italian, and Jewish people. The way in which racial categorizations are enforced, the shape of racism, has also changed over time. For example, the racial designation of Asian American and Pacific Islander changed four times in the 19th century. That is, they were defined at times as white and other times as not white. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders as designated groups have been used by whites at different times in history to compete with African American labor. That source is PBS series the power of illusion. Dr. Kamala Jones defines race as a structural opportunity. Racism is the next terminology. Dr. Kamala Jones was the former president of the American Public Health Association. And she defines racism as a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race. The Dismantling Racism Works Web Workbook defines racism as being different from racial prejudice, hatred, or discrimination. Racism involves one group having the power to carry out systematic discrimination through the institutional policies and practices of society and by shaping the cultural beliefs and values that support, support those racist policies and practices. The next term is systemic. And we're gonna use the Merriam-Webster definition for this. And I'm offering this definition, even though it sounds like it's scientific in nature 
for you to stretch your minds and actually relate it to racism. As an adjective, systemic is defined as of or relating to common to system, to a system such as affecting the body generally like systemic diseases, supplying those parts of the body that receive blood through the aorta rather than through the pulmonary artery or of relating to or being a pesticide that as used is harmless to that plant or higher animal, but when absorbed into its sap or bloodstream makes the entire organism toxic to pests, such as an insect or a fungus. Fundamental to a predominant social, economic or political practice. So if used in a sentence, our nation faces a fork in the road and a decision to either continue down the same path of systemic racism or to confront our past honestly. Bree Newsom. If used as a noun, systemic means a systemic pesticide, which leads us to our second to last term for the evening, white supremacy. The source of this definition is Dismantling Racism Works Web Workbook. The idea or ideology that white people and the ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions of white people are superior to people of color and their ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions. While most people associate white supremacy with extremist groups like the Ku Klux Klan and the neo-Nazis, white supremacy is ever present in our institutional and cultural assumptions that assign value morality, goodness, and human and humanity to the white group while casting people and communities of color as worthless, worthless, immoral, bad, and inhuman, and undeserving. Drawing from critical race theory, the term white supremacy also refers to a political or socioeconomic system where white people join, enjoy structural advantage and rights that other racial and ethnic groups do not, both at a collective and an individual level. And finally, anti-racism. Anti-racism is defined by race forward as the work of actively opposing racism by advocating for changes in political, economic, and social life. Anti-racism tends to be an individualized approach and set up in opposition to individual racist behaviors and impacts. Panel, what are your thoughts of these definitions? Or what does this strike in you when you hear these? I would say that uh, I guess a word that comes to my mind would be something you maybe have mentioned, but toxic, how something such as racism can become toxic within a society or within a community. So Hadia, it's, it's interesting whenever we talk about these words, I think sometimes the words are often um, misused, misunderstood, um, and almost turned against particular groups. So for example, when we talk about race, um, just as a, as a first example, all of them have different constructs and all of them depends on how you're talking about them. Um, their weight changes, right? So when we talk about race, one of the easiest things for folks to say right now is, well, I don't see color, we're all the human race. And so what they try to do is they take the definition provided and they talk, what, talk about what Dr. Jane Elliott, I believe is her last name. She does a lot on this kind of stuff. And, and she, if you take just a small part of what she says, you miss the bigger meaning. And sometimes that's what happens when we talk about race. Race really isn't a thing, so let's just stop talking about race because it doesn't really matter. Now that factors in the color blindness and some other concepts that we know exist. So it's critical that we understand what these words mean and how they're used and then use them appropriately. Um, I recognize they can be triggers for some folks because even when you talk about racism, a lot of folks will say, well, that automatic, if racism exists, that means I'm a racist, not necessarily. White, right, white supremacy exists, 
well, then that also means I'm a racist. That's not exactly what that means. So understanding these terms is critical, um, one, to not, not trigger fragility in other complexes, but two, to actually move the needle and start having meaningful discussions. Yeah, and I'll just add too that this notion of systemic um, as it relates to the understanding of um, white supremacy or I'll call it white centricity as well, I think is something that people struggle to understand. And one of the best analogies that I've heard, um, and this is hitting especially hard right now in California where we're dealing with wildfires, we have smoke in the air and those who are used to it can see it, right? And maybe those who aren't used to it can't see it with their eyes, but they experience it in a different way. If I went over to my windowsill right now and swiped along it, there would be residue, right? That I might not notice if I didn't go looking for it. Um, another analogy would be asking the goldfish about the water, right? And the fish says, what water? The fish doesn't recognize the water that's around because that's been its context this whole time. And when we talk about white supremacy, that's baked into our experience as Americans. I'll give you a really, example, a really um, easy example um, just that we've used already today. People of color. People of color refers to all of the people who aren't white, which places whiteness at the center of that conversation and places everyone else on the margins. So when we talk about marginalized people or minoritized people, those are people that are sitting in our current social status as the result of an action by a person who sits more close to the center of that experience. Um, and so I think if we think about it that way and we, um, we forego the opportunity to finger point and call out and cancel, but try professionally to have a constructive discussion about our context as a profession, then perhaps we can move the needle in the way that Dr. Embry mentioned. Thank you. Given the definitions, I wanna share with you what the profession looks like from a number standpoint by self-identified race and ethnicity. It's important to keep in mind that as we go through these sl slides, that sometimes these numbers are not an exact comparison as categories of identification vary from survey to survey and also depending on the time at which the survey was done. So for example, some surveys allow for you to pick other, some surveys allow you to pick two or more races. So with that, with that I'm going to share the screen again and start with the physical therapy workforce. So the physical therapy workforce data is information that's gathered and presented um, on the APTA website, which is where you could find this document. When we look at it, you do see some zero percentages next to Pacific Islander or Native Hawaiians, American Indians, or Alaska Natives. That doesn't mean there are no physical therapists that represent that population, but it means it's less than 1%. As expected with the topic of today, the physical therapy profession is 89% white. Hispanic or Latinos make up 3%, Asians 5%, those who self-identified as other is 2%, and African Americans or Blacks, not of Hispanic origin, 1%. When we look at this example from one of the US census data resources, this gives us a general look at how we compare as a profession, like we were talking about earlier in APTA statements to make this profession look more like what society looks like. It's definitely different. Instead of 89% of whites, like the physical therapy profession, of the United States, whites make up 34% who self-identify as not Hispanic or Latino. And then white alone category to the right of the screen in blue is 43%. If you put those two categories of white together, which is what probably most surveys um, are looking at, white, not Hispanic, 
That's 77% of the population. 10% is Hispanic or Latino. Blacks make up 7% instead of 1% in the physical therapy population. Two or more races is 2%. American Indian and Alaskan Natives make up 1% instead of 0%. And Asian alone, 3%. And Native Americans and, um, excuse me, Native Hawaiian and other along Pacific Islanders at 0%. Now let's take a look at some of our positions of leadership at APTA. The next slides will represent the year 2000 and the year 2020 so that you can have a look at what we looked like 20 years ago and what we look like today. So for chapter presidents by count, by race, what you're looking at is a pie diagram or chart that shows the larger, lighter blue area representative of white non-Hispanics, which are 61 identified chapter presidents. There, this is the year 2000. Hispanics, there were two, or Latino. There were none of any other race or ethnicity, except for one black Afri or African-American. Fast forward 20 years to the present, chapter presidents by counter race. We have 52 who self-identify as white or not Hispanic, one who self-identifies as black, and that is it. There's no other representation by race. When we take a look at chief delegates, in the year 2000, all of those that I have stacked on the left side, Pacific Islander, Native, Amer Native Hawaiian, Asian, American Indian, or Alaska Native, African American, or Black, are at 0%. They're also at a zero count. 49 or 94% of our chief delegates at the American Physical Therapy Association are white, non-Hispanic, and 2% identify as Hispanic or Latino, which represents one person. There are two that identified as other, representing 4% of the chief delegates. We fast forward to 2020, and does it look much different? 50 chief delegates representing 96% of the delegate, chief delegates. There are still no Hispanic or Latinos, no Asian, no American Indian or Alaska Native. One person identifies as Black, representing 2%. One person identifies as other, and there are no Pacific Islanders or Native Hawaiian. The year 2000 for delegates count by percentage or and count. So these are delegates, not chief delegates. 95% or 349 delegates are white. There's no representation for Hawaiian or Pacific Islanders. There's 0% or one American Indian or Alaska Native Four people identified as other, which only amounts to 1%. Hispanics or people who identify as Latino represent 1% at two, and Asians were at 1% with a number of four delegates in 2000, and six for African-American Blacks representing 2%. Let's fast forward to 2020 and see what we look like for the delegates. 97% are white, not Hispanic, which is a total of 330. There is no representation of American or American Indian or Native Alaskans. 3% of people did not select anything. African Americans, there's a total of seven delegates right now representing 2%. Asians have 14 representing 4%. 
Hispanic Latinos at eight count, which represents 2%, and nine people identified as other, representing 2%, which means there are no representation of Pacific Islanders or Native Hawaiians. And finally, our APTA volunteer count by percentage and race. So historically, APTA had a volunteer interest pool, which we called VIP. We have a really new and um, sophisticated system called APTA Engage. And I encourage all of you to go there. It's engage.apta.org. But this is an opportunity for people to put their names in the bucket and identify interests so that when opportunities arrive, the system will shoot you out opportunities that match your interest. So when we look at the people who have put themselves in, put their profiles in these, um, the system, whether they were told to because they were in a work group or whether they um, volunteered on their own and found it, the representation is similar to the other pages that we've seen. 77% of the representation of members in the volunteer interest in the APTA Engage are white. There are 110 African Americans, nine American Indians or Alaska Natives, 263 Asians, 146 Hispanic or Latinos, 72 who identified as other, seven Pacific Islanders, and 2,060 whites. The floor is yours, panelists. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny, so we, we talked about these numbers, even in preparation, and I think all of us that have been in leadership in, in APTA or been in, in, involved in APTA, we're like, we know it's bad. Like, we, we know it's bad. Then you see the numbers, and hopefully we all see the numbers and say, okay, we know it's bad. We know we have a question that somebody sent about the, the sections and not to steal Hadia's thunder. I don't know if you had those numbers, but basically the, the sections academies, they look very similar to what chapter presidents as far as numbers and representation for, for um, race and ethnicity, right? So, and we even had the pleasure of looking through, I think almost 20 years of what these data look like in, pre in preparation for today. And the numbers, remain relatively low and relatively small, right? They're just not there. Um, so it's not that they're, they're troubling, they're upsetting. Um, it's clear that something needs to be done. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna leave it there for a second, but those numbers should absolutely not only startle everyone who's watching or paying attention today or might look back at this later, they should upset. They should actually make you really question, what are we doing as a profession and an association if we look at who we're treating, right? If we look at what we're meant to do, it doesn't match at all with who's actually represented amongst ourselves or peers, especially even at leadership level. It just, it just should actually be really upsetting to you more than just, wow, that's, that's a statistic. Um, and not being upset about it, um, almost almost to the point of viscerally is 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 privilege to be quite honest with you if you don't look at that and just it's not a punch to the gut congratulations that's your first privilege test for today kai ready i might add that first of all i probably should have been shocked at the numbers but i wasn't Okay. If I were to go back and pull up 25 years ago, I don't think that we would see much difference. But I think as an organization that we have identified this as a problem. So I think in that respect, it gives us that opportunity to look at those see if there has to be changes and use that in order to move forward. You know, when I look at the volunteer pool, for example, you know, there's opportunities for us to get involved with a lot of things. And if we're gonna 
call this association our profession, then that's where we need to start, is how can we get involved to help with making some of those shifts. And be, Kai, before you go, I'm, um, I forgot to let the audience know that we will be having a, a 30 minute question and answer um, session at seven o'clock. So please feel free to put those in the chat and we'll get to your comments and questions then. Dr. Kennedy. Yeah, so I was I, I agree with um, both of my colleagues here about the opportunity that we have in front of us and, and how um, shocking even if not surprising, um, these trends are. Um, I think we would be doing ourselves a disservice though if in our strategy, we didn't also ask what the barriers have been, right? So far be it to, for me to believe I'm the first person that ever had high aspirations um, in this profession, right? And so I find myself wondering what the person, the generation ahead of me or the two or three generations ahead of me, what they aspired to do, what barriers they met against, and if and how those things have been approached, um, and and you know um, how we've attempted to change them over time. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned in our history, and I think if we don't um, examine it in totality, and I don't just mean the paragraph on Wikipedia, right, or um, the history page of the institution that I work in, but I mean more broad and more deep understanding of, of really who we are as a profession, or at least who we have been. And then the opportunity to, um, I'm gonna come back to build a community that values the, the experience of every member, right? And if we're talking about our organization, that's 100,000 plus people. Um, and if we're not getting their perspective and their experience in this association, then we've already disadvantaged ourselves about how to move forward in representing all of them adequately. And so Eddie, I think that's key. If go I ahead. Can back in. So that's that's what's really interesting. I think I think Eddie already mentioned it. Is who's sitting at the table when something does come up and we need to have a conversation, right? So if there is really something about social justice that particularly affects Black and Brown population, but specifically Black people in our country, if there's no one there there's no one to engage in the conversation from a leadership level, right? And so we're not sitting at the table and you might hear the Tyler Perry, you know, we'll just go build our own table. That's cool in some instances, but also, and that's kind of in my parallel, that's what it feels like AAPT has done and I applaud and I love that. But I also feel like with the member organization of 100,000 plus, we have to be there. We have to be there engaged in the conversation and not to be rude and not to be crude, but it can't be a group of white men talking about what it means to be diverse and how we need to improve diversity within an association or organization or whatever the case may be. Now, our profession that is not happening um, in the sense that it's all white men, but in our profession, it is really happening that when we're talking about diversity um, and inclusion and equity, typically what's happening is we're going to a very, very small well and we're putting this huge tax on a very small number of people we're expected to rise to a standard or we get we get definitions and programs that might really not be in the best interest of those that we, that we hope to serve and have those programs actually benefit. Eddie, what is the process? What was the process for you becoming a fellow um, at AAPT and why do you think you're not one of APTA? Oh, you got the hard questions today, do you? Uh, well, first of all, I was a member of AAPT for about 10 years, and I served on uh, several committees. I volunteered to do some work with the organization, and uh, it was recognized. And I have to mention that the person that recognized me was who was someone that was my mentor when I was working on my doctorate, and that's Dr. Linda Woodruff, and she is the one that actually nominated me for that. And I think if we talk a little bit about the AAPT and the history a little bit that goes back was there was some feeling at some point that African Americans, Black people were not felt welcome within APTA. And so that organization was kind of spun off 
as a result of that. I think that those things from that standpoint have changed some, but there's still some people that still have some, you know, bad feelings about the past. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've been a member of the APTA since 92, and I was a member of AAPT running concurrently at the same time. I was one of those people that were going to the APTA meetings and uh, being the only African American in the room. Okay. So I, I, I think that the second part of your question is, I think that being involved with APTA eventually would put me in a position to be considered for a fellowship. I mean, a fellow status. But I think, uh, as Aaron mentioned, you have to put the time in. You got to be seated at the table. It's not going to come looking for you. Aaron, what was some of your um, pathway to uh, being the first person of color or Black man um, president, Black person um, in South Carolina? Did you know that that was the case when you were running for it or had you held other offices? No, so I knew in, in South Carolina, we have an interesting structure where not, it's not interesting, probably most people have it, but we have a president elect year. Um, and it's one of those things where you just keep showing up. We have a state here in South Carolina and I'm not originally from South Carolina, but having been lived here, having lived here for, I'd say it is now the majority of my life actually. Um, if you get involved and you show up and you keep showing up, like people are like, oh, this guy just wants to keep doing stuff. So it keeps showing up and you keep showing up and you keep showing up and you just kind of work your way and you learn a lot of, along, along the way, right? If you're really bad at it, then obviously you're not going to progress anywhere. But as you learn lessons and you get more involved, et cetera, et cetera, you just kind of grow in the profession and the association, et cetera. So I started as a student and I just stayed around and I always just happened to stay around. And I'm that kind of guy that's just going to stay around and do stuff and work and serve and that kind of thing. Um, and, and leadership became really interesting to me. So went through, was on the board and then VP and then president and just kept working my way up. And it, it's never anything where I sat down and said, I have an aspiration to be the president of my state association. It just felt like the right thing to do. Um, I was excited about it. I knew it was going to be a challenge, but what I also knew was going into it, um, to be quite frank with you, I don't know how much of my identity I can actually wear on my sleeve. I don't know how much of this I can actually talk about that for fear of retribution or turning people off or whatever, especially as a young president, young in, in age and young in tenure. Um, you're, you're late 30s and you're kind of doing something. You've got some very seasoned, awesome members that you're trying to lead. You don't want to turn people off and you're trying to build bridges and build coalitions, etc. So I didn't say anything. I just kind of kept quiet. Those that know me knew. But I didn't ask the question until I was in my very final year of being president. And I started looking around and I knew when I'd been to all the meetings, it's me and maybe one other person in the room with a little bit of melanin, maybe a little bit of pigment, something like you just kind of know there aren't a lot of us around. So I started um, probing and I started asking the question, has there been anybody else in South Carolina, a person of color, black person, period, to be president? Um, and we went all the way back to the 1950s when our state was actually um, incorporated or whatever the proper word is, and there hadn't been. Um, and I asked the historians that I knew at the time and still know, no, there hadn't been. Um, and so it wasn't until literally I was rolling off as president that I started to be more vocal and saying something. Um, I'll say it's one of the things that I was always afraid of saying something about. I would try to subtly move the needle in the right direction. And in that, I kind of feel like I failed. Um, or learned some things. I don't think I was as brave as I could have been and needed to be, but it was, it was never celebrated. It was never really acknowledged. It was just nothing to it, um, even in our own state. And I can tell you more stories about that as we go along too. But um, long answer to say, it, it's just something that you do. Um, and you have this weight of not wanting to fail as president, but as a person of color, as a black person in a predominantly white association, your biggest fear is not fail for me, not fail for who might come behind me. Because if I screw this up, I don't know when the next time somebody's gonna get a shot. Excuse my language, I don't know when that's gonna be. And that's an intense pressure that I don't think a lot of people really appreciate or understand. 
Kai, I want to. Uh, we've heard a lot in the news lately again about systemic violence, specifically in which Blacks are the target. Health disparities have been loudly unveiled to the eyes whose lids um, were previously voluntarily shut, one would say. Can you talk about how you relate or see the impact of systemic racism on Blacks in the physical therapy profession, either from the students to PTAs or PT perspective? Sure, um, and I'll try to do so succinctly. However, the, the notion of systemic racism is deep and broad and far reaching. Um, and that's sort of the point of calling it systemic, yeah? So when you, if you, uh, let me, okay, let me use an example. I gave an assignment in my class, it's called Place Matters, right? And so we're very used to as physical therapists and as healthcare professionals, knowing that your zip code can tell you as much about your health status as anything else. But often we stop our conversation there and we don't talk about why some people are in some zip codes and why other people are in other zip codes or why the zip codes were drawn the way they were, right? Like they're not perfect lines on a map. Where, where do these squiggles come from? Why does this zip code shoot up this way and back down, right? And so if you go back and you try to understand the, the cause and effect of even what the zip code is, then you start to understand these disparities, right? And so, um, my students, many of them, um, when prompted with the question, identify a health disparity and identify a policy that relates to that health disparity, many of, the, many of them discovered for the first time a process called redlining. And redlining is a system practice that dictated who lived in this area and who lived in that area, right? And so they began to understand the zip code, the numbers do not decide the health outcomes of the people who live in it but the people who decided what that zip code was gonna be and who was gonna live there and what resources were gonna be allocated or more importantly, not allocated mm -hmm. to the people living there, um, those are the drivers of the disparities that we see. And so when we start to think about systemic racism, I don't want, we, I don't want us to try to count the number of racists in the system. Right? It's not about the number of individuals who occupy the label of racist, but it is about the practices and the policies that systematically include some and exclude others. So when we talk about systemic racism, when we talk about systemic violence, it, are, it is this system of practices that repeatedly, generation after generation, disadvantage and, oh, by the way, advantage groups of people as well. Um, so when we think about systemic racism from the lens of PT, we need to think about our referral practices. We need to think about our payment uh, structures. We need to think about our admissions policies. We need to think about our pedagogy because there's opportunities that we have to dismantle these uh, trajectories of systemic violence or to perpetuate them. And if we don't do the due diligence of understanding what those systems are, it's likely that we'll perpetuate them and continue having disadvantage and advantage for groups and subgroups in our uh, profession. Thank you. So we are closing in to our question and answer session of the program. And before we do that, I would like to go around to each of you and give you an opportunity to share or further share some examples, thoughts, and or ideas of how we move forward as a profession and association and individuals. Dr. Trailer, I'd like to start with you. Okay. So the first part you had there about moving forward as individuals, it's what I kind of mentioned earlier, get involved. Okay. We are at the point where we should be at the table expecting to have a voice and that, but that also means that when you went back to your definition of equity, along with equity comes opportunity. Mm. And it is up to us to take advantage of that opportunity. So as a group, as a community that I like to refer to, you know, start at that level, start at the community level, getting the word out, letting people know, we want you to help us, we want you to get involved this is also your association. 
It is not my association. It is yours. You, when you decided to be a physical therapy professional, this became part of your association. And then the last part of that is from a professional standpoint, I have made it a pledge of mine to be involved as much as I can. I, you know, I, yes, I have a lot of spare time. I'm sure most of you realize, but I want to be on those committees. I want to be that person that is uh, making, helping to make decisions for things that will help us to move forward. And I think that often we have people that are voicing their concern but they're not willing to step up. And so I think part of maybe just hearing this will give them that opportunity. And then also a little bit of extra encouragement along the way. And then the other part to the, about where we go from here is, it's a terrible cliche to say, but there's nowhere to go but up that from this point. Thank you. And Dr. Embry, your thoughts as we move into the Q&A? All right, ask me again, so I make sure I ask, I answer the right question. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> it happens sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely, no problem. So the question on the table is for you to share examples, thoughts, or ideas of how we move forward as a profession and association and, and or as individuals. All right, so I'm gonna to try to stick on the move forward. I think it's important that we that we really recognize and we reconcile the fact that we have a lot of members that are hurt and continue to be hurt. We are still in an association where we have members that are either intentionally or unintentionally doing things to hurt other members. Um, in terms of in terms of race, specifically, is what we're talking about today. We're still hearing racist comments and thoughts. Um, we're still not really confronting what it means to understand those five or six terms that we, we started this, the discussion with, to really dig into those and understand what those actually mean. Not from a lens of shame, but from a lens of what is it doing to the people that I say I care about, that are my colleagues, that my, my professionals, my patients, whatever the case may be. Um, so I think that's, that's where the work has to be done by everyone. I think we have to move past, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm proponent of, you know, making sure we're building resiliency. I'm tired of telling my own people, be more resilient and work through. We have to start taking apart what is forcing people to be more resilient, what is forcing people to have to work twice, twice as hard to be seen as half as good. We have to start dismantling those systems, period. Some of it comes from a system level, a lot of it comes from a system level, a lot of it comes from an individual level. If a member comes to you and says, hey, I would like for my association to put something out about social justice because it really means something to me. Hear that member. Don't say we're not in the business of that and dismiss it. Hear that member, understand where they're coming from and engage in a dialogue and discussion, uh, not just one-on-one, -on -one, but as a board, as a leadership, whatever the case may be, and don't just dismiss the concern. So going forward, deal with your own issues but also start to dismantle the system to be quite honest with you that if wherever you are on your, your privileged status, under, status, understand that, understand where you are, and then help to make meaningful change. We all have to do that at this point. And the only part, one of the few times I'll actually disagree with old Dr. Trailer down there, it can get worse. It absolutely <laughs> worse. It is our choice whether or not we want to make it get worse and allow it to get worse. That's what we get to do. If we're passive, if all of us are passive collectively, this will 100% without a doubt, this will get worse. It absolutely will. So it's imperative that we actually start to act and we do something meaningful, not just words, um, not just representation, but actually do meaningful work to make this better for everyone. Dr. Kennedy, can you take two or three minutes and share your thoughts? Absolutely. Um, so there's one thing I know about everybody on this call and everybody listening in, which is that you have a connection to physical therapy. Most of you, in fact, are clinicians. 
we are in the pra practice of identifying problems and working to solve them, right? So let's employ some of those same strategies. If a lack of representation in our leadership structures are the symptom, let's figure out what the disease is. If we've decided already the disease is racism, let's try to understand that disease process to figure out how to address it, right? So I can speak to you from my experience as one human being, but I was no scholar. So what did I do? I went reading. I went to try to understand what it is that I was dealing with and how to figure out how to address it, right? My role is vice chair of equity. And in my department, we've got a, a clinical practice arm, we've got an educational arm, and we've got a research arm. I'm vice chair in all of those spaces. So I've got to figure out how do I help my researchers be less racist in their research? How do I help my faculty members have anti-racist educational practice? How do I help my clinicians and my administrators comb through their data and understand the patient experience? And oh, by the way, the employee experience, right? We, on, we don't only have issues when we're students. We graduate and we're still human beings living in the same bodies. So if we're not understanding what our employees are experiencing, what our students are experiencing, what our colleagues are experiencing, or what we're experiencing ourselves, then we haven't set ourselves up to provide a good intervention, right? We need to understand what we're dealing with. We need to understand what types of processes, what types of tools, what types of practices have helped to dismantle these things in the past? We need to look to places that have been successful with reconciliation, places like South Africa, who have attempted actively to dismantle apartheid, right? We haven't gone through that process in our profession. We haven't gone through that process in our country. And so what I would suggest to you is a systems thinking approach where you do a root cause analysis. This is my problem. Why is it my problem? Well, why is that factor there? right? And go all the way down until you get to the root cause of it. And that tells you your way forward. And so it depends. It depends, right? That we love to say that in PT. It depends on where you're sitting. It depends on what you need to do. And it depends on how well you understand your problem and are prepared to address it. So that's where I would start. I would start with your own understanding. I would start with your own circumstance and context. And I would work from that place. Thank you all so much. This has been a riveting conversation, which I know that we could probably take for hours on end. And I definitely want to um, share some of the audience's questions and answers. And we are in an association and a profession in which our board has not elected any person of an underrepresented minority um, group in the 21st century. Um, we have a board that currently does not have underrepresented minorities. So these are people running the show, but we definitely have leaders amongst us. And I think and hope that today has been an opportunity for people to not just think outside the box about the issues. And it's kind of like health disparities. We know they exist, but what are we gonna do about them to not just mitigate them, but obliterate them. People often say that the system is broken in this country and the system is not broken. The system is working exactly as it was designed. It needs, as Dr. Embry said earlier, to be dismantled. And I wanna leave you with two quotes from President Sharon Dunn and Dr. John Lewis. And then we're gonna go into question and answer. So one of the statements that our president, Dr. Sharon Dunn, asserted in 2020 was fixing racism in America is an American problem. And that our vision charges us not to stand at a distance and point our fingers, as Dr. Kennedy mentioned earlier, at our nation's ills, but instead to accept a personal responsibility to try to make a difference. And John Lewis, Dr. John Lewis, the late John Lewis shares with us in one of his final statements, if you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. Thank you, panelists. Let's get into these questions and try to take one to two minutes to respond so that we can get through as many as possible in the next 25 minutes. 
Um, Eric Kruger, an assistant PC professor, he's wondering about curriculum guidelines or recommendations, et cetera, for anti-racist education in PT school for PT learners. Is there anything in the works or groups working on this? I'll jump in there. Um, I, I don't know of any specific groups that are um, working on this pedagogy and or curriculum piece in PT education, but there certainly are more broadly. Um, and I found a community of folks who are very interested in this topic um, more broadly across the healthcare spectrum and around the world. Um, I will recommend a couple of theories and pedagogies that I think would be useful, um, just that or that have been to me in my research. And um, a critical pedagogy is one of those. And Paulo Freire, um, and forgive me, I have zero Portuguese in my linguistic talents here, um, but a Brazilian scholar from the 70s wrote The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and that was the original text that really um, spun off critical pedagogy. And the book I held up earlier, this reader is like many, many authors that have expanded upon that in various ways. And so I appreciate what I appreciate about critical pedagogy is this sort of question everything notion, right? So this, um, this unwillingness to sort of take um, information at face value, but to really sort of dig in and explore it and understand it more wholly. Um, there certainly is a plethora of literature at the current moment available around anti-racist practices. And I think that that includes pedagogy and curriculum. Um, another book that I've read that is relative is called um, uh, For White Folks Who Teach in the Hood and the Rest of Y'all Too by Christopher Embiid, I think is his name. Um, the, it's on my shelf in the other room. Um, but that is another um, book that speaks more from a K-12 perspective, but is still relevant, I think, at all levels of education. Um, so I would encourage you to, um, if you haven't already, look into those theories and those pedagogies and also reach out to me because I'm doing it too and I would love to be in a community of practice with you. India, you just muted yourself and then started talking. I sure did. Thank Here's you. Here's what I'll add, Eric. I don't have the resources, like the references that Kai just, you know, she's amazing. So she's just always going to do that for you. <laughs> from, a, from a systems perspective, typically PT departments or, or PT faculty are made up of multiple people. Start talking about the faculty and not, anyway, specifically what I'm talking about. When I'm saying talking to the faculty, what is the interest in actually changing how we look? At our curriculum, right? Um, from my very limited experience, it seems like there's a lot of resistance to significant changes in curriculum just as a general rule. So whenever we start talking about things like racism, social justice, um, allyship, whatever the case may be, you might get some significant, significant resistance. So you're going to need to come armed with the re references and resources that, that Dr. Kennedy has provided you but also just start to take the temperature. Understand this is gonna take a long time of planting many, many seeds for people to actually start to see you've gotta do something different. Also make sure you're utilizing and leveraging your students because the students have a real appetite to see a change in this. And we see a lot of students that are popping up that are saying, we gotta do something di different with this curriculum because all of our patients are white. Like all of our integumentary information is all on white people. This isn't like, I don't know what a rash looks like on a black person because I don't see it. What does SCAR look like on somebody who is melanin rich? I don't know what that looks like because we literally never talked about that in school. So the students see this stuff and they're interested. So, so pull them, bring them in, um, and that'll also help to, to gear this conversation up amongst faculty. Thank you, Dr. Ambria. Yeah, and thanks for that uh, comment about the skin. I too brought that up at my institution, uh, Mayo Clinic, because our electronic health records were set up that we designed them as an, as an institution. And it always asked, is the skin pink? Like that was your sign if something was wrong. Um, and so I you know, said at ground rounds, I was like, this could be one place that we start um, by uh, breaking down some of those um, more subliminal, but to us explicit um, barriers to better health care. Angela uh, Beta or Abita Campbell asked, um, what about section or academy presidents she did not see um, them 
by race or ethnicity. And I'm happy to share that with you now. Um, for the section um, presidents, for those who selected none, there was zero. For African-American or black, zero. For American Indian or Alaska Native, zero. This is a count, not a percentage. For Asians, zero. For section presidents. For Hispanic or Latino, one. One person identified as other. Zero people have identified. This is 2020 that I'm reporting. Um, Pacific Islander and Native American, zero. And 20 of the section presidents are white, non-Hispanic. So very similar to the rest of the numbers, if not ex almost exactly the same. So Stephanie Deshano Wakeman, she said, um, could we please provide a, a list, uh, list the book titles? So hopefully somebody will catch that or if you wanna put them in the Zoom chat for us, Dr. Kennedy, um, Amelia can transfer those over to the Facebook Live. Can I offer just a quick website? Yes. If you Google UCSF PT and click on Solidarity in Action, there's a list of anti-racism self-study resources um, that was crowdsourced by our department. So our students, clinicians, faculty members all together. It's about 15, 16 pages of things, um, books, articles, podcasts, uh, TED Talks, albums and poems and TV shows and the whole nine. So something for every learning style. And another one that I'll offer and share with Amelia to post is the Schomburg Library in New York City was listed. Um, it could be a hundred different things of books and resources to look at, but I'll share that as well. I'm sure it'd be between those two websites alone. You have plenty to be drawing in. Uh, Felicia Clemens says she's a second year PT student at WashU in St. Louis, my alma mater. Hello. I am one of two black students in a class of 88. I was one, so you're not alone. Any advice for how students can help their schools move towards a more diverse and inclusive student body? Hmm. Eddie, you got it? I don't know if I can handle that one or not. That's a tough one. Um, I think part of what you can start with is reaching out to other individuals, reach out to different mentors, reach out to different programs and have them to share some of their information with you. I know that PT schools, you know, across the country have what I would call greater, harder admission standards, and it seems to be increasing each day. But I would say start with reaching out to some people, faculty members, ask them those questions. What is it that they think would help do those things? Make those connections. Uh, they may end up being a mentor for you because while they may not be able to change your current situation, maybe they can help you down the road and then in turn have you help someone else. But I would say that would be a good place to start is just reaching out, asking those questions to people. Uh, I have several students around the country that I am in constant contact with and I hear that statement a lot. I am the only person of color in my PT class. And sometimes they just need someone to be able to uh, talk to them about that or talk them through those things. Not sure if that helped you, but that's a starting point. We're getting quite a bit of um, questions now. So Aaron, if you wanna take a minute and then we'll go to the next. 
Yeah, so I, I see uh, looking at some of the questions they're, they're coming up to, there are a lot of questions about students and people who are currently experiencing like the only and feeling like they're the only and sometimes feeling marginalized. It's a word that, that Kai introduced us to earlier. Um, we can always talk about, okay, you're not going to be the only one. True. We're going to have to reach out to other groups. Absolutely do that. You still shouldn't have to be forced to build this resilience. We talked about that earlier, right? So there's something that your program actually needs to do. There are some instances around the country of student-led groups where they're saying, all right, we, we're just gonna do something about this. So your cohort might have two of 88, the third years, first year, second years, I think you said you were a- uh, 88, one of 88. Yeah, second year, so your second year, one of 88, two of one or one or two of 88, whatever. First year and third years, y'all gonna have to get together. You don't have to talk. And you're gonna figure out what does our program look like? And maybe we're going to a local high school and this is a program that y'all develop. Um, keep it simple. Don't overly tax yourself. Keep it really simple. You're going to go to your local high school that's close. And there are plenty in St. Louis. I got family in St. Louis. There are plenty in your area um, that are underserved and, and filled with minority students that might be interested in the field of physical therapy. And y'all just go talk to them. And you're going to try to bring them to a classroom. You're going to start the establishing programs. That's not going to change immediately. But the hope is that every student every year that comes through heard about your program has access to it and that's how you start to develop these things um, here in south carolina at musc we've got physical therapy exploration program um, which is Pet coast so we have a couple programs and they're all student-led student-driven student-organized and then what's beautiful about it is the alumni come back every year and they help organize they make sure things are taken care of and and, and it becomes sort of a thing that that is almost self-sustaining but by the students who have either participated or graduated from that program. And I know we're short on time, but if we, I could just add on and I'll promise I'll loop in another question. Um, I just wanna lift up something that both of my colleagues have mentioned and it's relationship building. Relationship building is key to integrating um, previously homogenized groups. And so whether it's Dr. Trailer talking about the relationships that he continues with people over the country, or what Aaron is talking about in a sustainable student-led program, what you don't want to do is drop in on a Saturday, do the thing that makes you feel good and never show up again, because that effort is not going to have any long-lasting impact on our profession. And for the person who asked, what is med school doing that we aren't? I don't know if the schools are doing a ton different, but every kid in every hood knows what a doctor is. Does every kid in every hood know what a PT is? Those are the places we need to go and start developing relationships with the community at large, right? So now when that student has become aware of physical therapy and they're expressing some interest in it, they can go to that grandmother and instead of the grandmother saying, boy, you're gonna be a doctor or a lawyer, they can say, yeah, physical therapy sounds like a great career, let's pursue that route, right? So there has to be relationship building with the entire community to really support this. So that leads and connects with the question that I was going to pose to the group next, which is um, to the board and addressing white centricity. Can we speak to the distinction of allyship versus being an accomplice? Um, and I would add to that question to the panelists that a lot of what we've been talking about is what the individual or those who are marginalized or underrepresented can do. Um, so maybe in responding to this question about the distinction of allyship and being an accomplice is that um, we can reiterate or comment also on what those who are in power can do. Aaron, I'll let you start that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny. I'm glad you said that because I actually just had the, the, the pleasure and the privilege of sitting in and kind of participating, I won't say kind of, participating in a, in a book club for 28 days, or White Supremacy and Me, 28 days. It's a, it's a cool book. It started out as an Instagram challenge, and the author turned it into a whole book. And you can basically go through and you can read this book. One, you're going to learn a lot about terms. Two, if you do it right, you're going to be challenged. I don't care who you are or where you come from. If you do it right and you do the work and you do the writing, you're going to be challenged going through the book. Three, when it comes to those that are in power, and we talked about, or we can talk about power dynamics and what that looks like, there still needs to be um, what Kathy O'Bear calls white accountability spaces, right? We're, we're 
white people need to get together and actually have the conversation and say, hey, am I perpetrating the things that we say that we don't really want to do? And how am I doing that? And how do I stop doing these things? Um, so that's that's where I'll start. Um, they, the white centricity or the white centricity is a thing. I, I don't care if you want to believe it or not. It is a thing. Step back and think about it from the most basic sense of the language we use and the terms we use when you're describing something as white versus black. Even in saying that connotation that one is good and one is bad and all terms surrounding is either good or bad if they're attached to the either even the word white and black. Uh, so I'll pause there and give my other panelists some time. I was just going to add that, you know, you're so right, Aaron. And one of the things is that whenever I walk in to see a patient or a patient walks in to see me, the first thing they're going to see is a black man. They're not going to see, and it's generally that descriptor before the word man. Then it's a black man who happens to be a physical therapist. So I think that when we were talking earlier, that one of the things that I decided years ago was I had to be on my A game in order to measure up to someone who is not a black man that's a PT. So if we keep that in mind, and we and and the fact that you know we really shouldn't have to, but it's one of the things that, like I said, I decided that I wanted to be the best that I could be, so that I wouldn't be judged as just the black man, but I'm going to see my physical therapist. Right, we are in rapid fire. Did you, you can say something, Kai. Um, after this next one, I'm gonna ask one of you to respond to each of the questions or comments that I'll share with the group you were gonna say. Yeah, I was just gonna mention um, the notion of amplification and allyship. So you heard earlier that I sit on the APTA nominating committee. The process by which that happened is someone nominated me, I decided to consent to serve and run. The person who nominated me, I did not know him. I didn't even know it was him. I, I learned of this person on the night that I was elected. But this person um, had encountered me at a conference and taken note of what my expertise was and what my skill set was and thought this might be useful in our leadership structure and just put my name in, right? I still had the opportunity to say I'm not interested or I am or that sort of thing. But amplifying voices um, and stepping out of the echo chamber is one really easy way that allies can start to uh, dismantle some of the traditions of, 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 of homogeny in terms of who is considered an expert and who gets the power to make those decisions. Um, so look outside the box that you're in and amplify. Thank you. So, Amara Jose Mendoza um, mentions that student debt hits white and black students. I was attracted to the profession due to the rise in science in the profession. Other professions in computer science and pharmacology attracted the elite minorities due to the colorblind nature of its profession. Money is not the issue. What are your thoughts on that comment? Do you agree? Did you... We'll take it. All right. Not to disrespect the question, I, I don't. It didn't seem like there was a lot of a question in there. I think there's there's truth in that statement. So. Okay. What strategies have you seen for outreach to middle school and high school or the university levels that were successful? Um, I, it depends on what your goal is, right? So um, right now, my, my program has a goal in partnership with a local middle school. Um, our goals are to expose them to role models in physical therapy, secondarily and primarily to give them lessons around adolescent health that support their science curriculum and their PE curriculum. Um, 
I think it's successful because it's long term, it's regular, we go once a month, um, and we've been doing so for a number of years. Um, but it depends on what your goal is. So again, if you're, if you're looking to increase enrollment in your program, um, then your middle school efforts better include a long term tracking progress or process, right? So if you're, if you're working with sixth graders, and after the sixth grade, you don't know what happens, then it's going to be difficult for you to know if your efforts are um, effective or not. Um, and so I think you have to be intentional about what your goals are, and then you have to be intentional about your evaluation of your processes. You know, that's where we always fail is tracking. You've got to track. Institutions do this and they're like, oh, great, you came to my institution. So success. Well, what if you went to the institution down the street? That's still super valuable. We've got to figure out a better way of actually tracking and using outcome measures. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to go around Robin again for final thoughts. One minute final thoughts. Michael Hunt, one of our passions or callings at Campbell University in Buis Creek, North Carolina is serving rural counties, specifically those who fall in the historically quote unquote medically disadvantaged population. What strategies do you recommend that clinicians and student PTs implement to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion in such areas? Further, regarding healthcare access, what are some of the racial disparities that you may have noticed while working with rural individuals? We'll be here for another three hours unpacking the complexity. <laughs> I'm just gonna be honest. That is so thick. That is so rich. There is not a short answer that any of us could possibly give you to get to the bottom of that. Like it, that's gonna that's gonna take. Come back to part two. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, but I, but I will say that I think a lot of what we've mentioned already about serving underserved communities holds true here. So. My first academic appointment was at Mary Baldwin University in the western part of the state of Virginia. Shout out Mary Baldwin, Stanton, Fishersville, the whole Augusta County. Um, and one of the things that we did, we, it was a new physical therapy program at a very long-standing institution. And as we developed that College of Health Sciences, we made it a part of our mission to be ser of service to that rural community. So we went to the clinicians in the area, we went to the hospitals in the area, we went to the undergraduate institutions in that area. And we, we said, what's important to you? What do you need? We heard things that we wouldn't have heard if we didn't ask those questions, right? Like they said, we take students from schools right now, but a lot of the students come from the big city, they do their clinical rotation and they move back to the big city. What we need are people to help bolster our workforce. So what did we do? We created, um, uh, articulation agreements with some of the smaller, more rural-based schools where students who have chosen to learn in a rural environment might continue to choose to learn in a rural environment and might continue to live their lives in that rural environment post-graduation. Uh, we also integrated those partners into our curriculum. So with a course like Community Practicum, rather than having a student-led um, uh, effort where the students identified what they needed, we let the clinicians and the community identify what the needs were, and then the students self-selected projects to help the community realize its need, right? And so being community-centered means going to the community and saying, what do you need from us? And then working with them to make it happen. Thank you. It has been fantastic um, sitting with you all, and I can't believe it's already been 90 minutes. So if you could take 30 to 60 seconds to leave us with some final thoughts, that'd be great. And to the audience, thank you so much for your participation and your attention and your presence here for this talk and for the future talks coming up on pipelines as well as pathways to leadership. Dr. Eddie Treller, I'd like to start with you. I'd like to say once again, Adia, thanks for hosting us tonight, giving us the opportunity and I think my final thought would be if I had the opportunity to have a conversation with someone who was overtly racist, or you had mentioned earlier about being a skinhead, and to be able to have that conversation and ask, are you truly against, you know, Black people? Are you truly, and what, what why are, is that? and give them that opportunity to say that. And if they truly believe that, 
then I would probably go that next step and say, then do you believe that no black athletes should attend predominantly white institutions? Back to Ambry. Start my little timer because I think you're taking jabs at me for going to. <laughs> no, I do appreciate being here. I'm so glad to be a part of the conversation. Um, hopefully, I get the, the opportunity to continue to be a part of conversations going forward. So thank you to APTA for hosting this. Um, I have to give just like a special shout out because there's been one person through my whole PT journey um, from the time I was a student until today. And she's retired. Um, and she's somebody who has shaped who I am, who has helped strengthen my resolve, who has helped to, to, to give me that freedom and courage and, and, and encouragement to continue to speak and to be vocal when need be. Um, we already talked about Linda Woodruff, the late great Linda Woodruff. There's another name that follows right behind her for me and that's Johnette Meadows. I couldn't be here today without Johnette Meadows. I'll be honest with you. Like just the, the strength and the soul that she's given so many, many of us that are in this organization is real. So um, from me to you, Johnette, I love you. I appreciate you, APTA. I love you as an organization. I look forward to the changes and better days ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Kai Kennedy. Um, I thank you also for the opportunity to be engaged in this conversation. And um, since we're in the spirit of, of acknowledging and thanking and lifting up, um, I'm gonna recount the day that I met Aaron Embry. And that day, um, and the person who facilitated it was President Sharon Dunn. And I went to her very frankly and I said, I don't know what's happening up there in the national level of APTA, but I'm down here and I'm ready to serve, right? And I really think that we have the opportunity to make change. And she took me by the hand over to that dude. And we've been in community ever since. And so any of you who are out there listening to this and who wanna be a part of the change, that's what building the community is about. And that's why I so appreciate our mission and our vision now, because they really set us up to work together, to collaborate as, and to operate as one unit to affect the change and to reach the vision that we say that we uh, ascribe to. Thank you. And again, I'm Stephanie Deshana Wakeman and Latinus Williamson Dixon. I see your questions about pipelines, um, leaderships and outreach and really encourage you. And, and I see the HBCU reference and I encourage you to attend the next two talks because I think those will definitely be poignant um, conversations in those next talks. To all, thank you for your presence and attendance and have a wonderful evening.